This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. The battle between President Joe Biden and House Speaker Mike Johnson over Ukraine aid and immigration policy is coming to a head this week as Congress races to avert a January 20th partial lapse in government funding. Leaders of both parties announced the contours of a spending plan yesterday, but it doesn't include the $61 billion in aid to Ukraine that Biden wants or the stringent border protections that conservative Republicans want. Last week, Johnson led a delegation of Republican lawmakers to the southern border in Texas. Last month alone, we saw the most illegal crossings in recorded history. It is an unmitigated disaster, a catastrophe. White House Press Secretary Karim Jean-Pierre called it a political stunt. This immigration system has been broken for decades, and we need to have a bipartisan agreement to move forward on how to deal with the system. Joining me is Leon Fresco, a partner at Holland and Knight, and the former head of the Office of Immigration Litigation at the Department of Justice. How much pressure is there on Biden to strike a deal, considering the unprecedented number of migrants at the southern border last month? Also, a CBS News poll published Sunday found that two-thirds of Americans disapprove of his approach to the U.S.-Mexico border. I've personally been in touch with some of the people on the staff negotiating this deal, and I can tell you that there is a lot of pressure that the White House feels under to reach a deal. They are actually pretty much trying to circumvent a lot of the traditional groups that sort of advocate for more compassionate immigration laws and are really trying to come to a deal with the Republicans, basically meeting them 90 percent of the way to where they want to go to, which would mean dramatic reductions in the ability for people to ask for asylum through the southern border if they enter illegally across the border. Basically, under that scenario, they would be pushed back into Mexico and making people have to go in through the ports of entry instead of having to go in between the ports of entry that where they wouldn't be allowed, they would just be pushed back. And the basic leftover issue that hasn't been fully resolved is, can the president actually bring in people legally using his parole power during this time period, or would there be some time periods if the if the amount of crossings was too high, that then that parole period would be limited? And I think that's the final issue that they haven't come to an agreement on. But there is going to be an agreement that's going to upset, I think, both sides. The left will be upset because this era of being able to sneak across the border and ask for asylum is going to be over. That's going to be eliminated by this compromise, even when it gets reached. And on the right, they will be upset that there will be some authority that the president will still be able to keep to let people in if there are circumstances that merit letting people in. And so you're going to see whether you can cobble together enough of a centrist coalition to say that there's been a success on border policy. Has the Biden administration used immigration parole more than other administrations, and why is that such a sticking point for them? Yes, it has. In fact, there's been this thing called the CHNV, the Cuban, Haitian, Nicaraguan, and Venezuelan parole program, where they're letting in 30,000 people a month to just apply using the parole program to be able to come legally into the United States. And there's also what's called the Uniting for Ukraine program, which was a program that allowed Ukrainians to apply to enter the United States with paroles. And so the sticking point is, if that's gone, then for situations like Ukraine or other things, if the president limits his authority to be able to bring in people under those paroles, then there will be no way to bring people in. But these numbers, we're talking about something like 500,000 people being legally allowed to enter into the United States, in addition to the 3 million or so border crossers that are being apprehended on the southern border entering illegally. And so that's why the Republicans are saying their concern is because they don't like those kind of numbers. And then one sort of prudential problem that happens with people who are paroled in the United States is, great, you're paroled in, but then what happens? In a year, the parole expires, and very few people have another status they can switch to after this parole. And so that becomes another problem. 
Do you know what they've decided about things like tightening asylum interviews and expanding expedited deportations? While I can't say every line of the bill what it's going to be, I can generally say that if they can reach an agreement that gets distributed to the senators, there will be a recreation of the old Title 42, which basically says that during periods of high migration, the United States will be able to shut people out who are coming in between the ports of entry, meaning they will be able to push people out without doing anything. So there will be no excuse to cross the border illegally. Now, there will be some exceptions for very urgent humanitarian concerns, but that's it. Other than that, there will be no asylum process that can be accessed by people crossing the border, and that will be triggered by certain thresholds of increased immigration. And that's going to be one aspect of it. And the second aspect of it will be Even if you then get this opportunity to be questioned, it'll be at a higher level. So it will not be this credible fear process, but it will be at the higher level of the reasonable fear process, which in reality what that means is it'll go from about an 80% success rate where you're allowed to stay in the country to about a 40 to 50% success rate whereby you'll be allowed to stay in the country. And could any of these changes be implemented under the current law? No, no. In fact, Congress would be changing the statute, which is the thing that they haven't been allowed to do in the past, meaning there wasn't a congressional coalition that had enough votes to change the statute. So the idea is they would actually change the statute, which would be quite the interesting development. And some people would actually argue that it would actually run us afoul of treaties that we have written in the past adopting the refugee convention, but that can be done, meaning if the United States government wants to pull out of certain obligations that it's made under the refugee convention, it can do that by passing a statute that does that, but that may be what it actually has to end up doing here in order to vacate the previous commitments it made under the refugee convention. And the Mexican president, in return for help in stopping illegal immigration, he's demanding the U.S. give $20 billion to Latin America and Caribbean countries, grant work visas to 10 million Hispanics who've worked in the U.S. for at least 10 years, and end sanctions against Venezuela and halt the blockade of Cuba. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Those are unrealistic requests, and in fact, they actually cause a problem because they make President Biden look ineffectual. When President Trump wanted Mexico to do certain things with regard to immigration, he simply said, I'm going to pull out of NAFTA and I'm going to tax remittances and I'm going to tax cars at 30 percent. And that scared uh, Obrador enough that he was willing to actually move forward and do what Trump wanted. Whereas if he's making all of these demands for, for cooperation with Biden, who sort of isn't making these crazy demands back then it sort of leads people to think, well, maybe Trump had the right approach here, which was to threaten Mexico. Now, I understand President Biden has wanted to be a good faith actor here, but if the good faith isn't rewarded, then you start to say, well, maybe there's other ways we need to deal with Mexico. Is the House going to be an impediment to this deal getting through? This is the issue, which is, at the end of the day, what is the House going to do? Is is there going to be a disagreement where President Trump says no matter what deal is reached, that the deal is too weak. Does that cause too many House members to then defect because President Trump said the House is too weak? And then does that make Speaker Johnson have to make a decision between maintaining his speakership and funding the government? Because the problem is, if the Senate actually reaches a deal and passes a deal to fund the government, which includes a border deal, which is essentially free money for the Republicans from the standpoint that it will probably do very little to make Democrats happy. And if Republicans still reject that quote-unquote free money on the border because they say it's not enough, then they're going to look bad. And that will put Speaker Johnson in a terrible position where either he will be blamed for shutting down the government or he'll lose his speakership for putting it up for what's called a vote on suspension, where Democrats would do most of the heavy lifting along with, let's say, 50, 60 Republicans in order to pass the budget. But then that would lead the majority of his conference to be very upset at him 
and vote him out of the speakership. Coming up next, we're going to leave Congress and turn to the courts. New York has filed a suit against the bus companies bringing migrants to the city. And the Biden administration has filed a suit against Texas. I'm June Gross when you're listening to Bloomberg. New York City Mayor Eric Adams announced a lawsuit against bus and transportation companies that helped transport asylum seekers from Texas to New York City, calling their actions bad faith conduct. Our administration filed a lawsuit against 17 companies that have taken part in Texas Governor Greg Abbott's scheme to transport tens of thousands of migrants to New York City in an attempt to overwhelm our social services system. The lawsuit seeks $708 million to cover the costs of caring for the migrants sent to the city in the past two years. I've been talking to immigration law expert Leon Fresco, a partner at Holland and Knight. So this is based on a law in New York that penalizes people who, quote, bring a needy person from out of the state into this state for the purpose of making him a public charge. I mean, has there been another lawsuit like this before? Right. There have been other lawsuits that have tried to enforce provisions like this in other states, and they've been ruled to be unconstitutional because they violate the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution, whereby, you know, if you're in one state, you're allowed to go from one state to another state. And states can't ban you from being transported from one state to the other. There's interstate commerce issues also. And so from that standpoint, it makes it very difficult for the state of New York to make a claim like this. Most likely that will be viewed as unconstitutional. They didn't even make the claim in federal court. They made the claim in the New York state court system. And I think the reason they did that is because they know that there's very little likelihood of success in this litigation, but they're just trying to make a point, especially since they're suing these bus companies. The bus companies probably don't want to spend a lot of money defending a lawsuit that they can at least try to get the bus companies to stop doing this, and that will at least solve some of the problem. Whereas if they had sued the state of Texas, that would have been a whole other thing where Texas would have had just as many resources as New York to litigate this, and probably New York would have realized this was not a high likelihood of success. The issue is here, this may not be designed so much for success, but rather to put the bus companies, who usually don't have a lot of capital, to a decision of whether they want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars litigating a lawsuit, or would they rather just settle out by not bringing people into New York? And I think that was the calculation here. Let's go to the, the Biden administration last week, yeah. suing the state of Texas over that new law that empowers the state to arrest people suspected of entering the country illegally. Is the Biden administration's lawsuit any different from the lawsuit that was filed by the uh, county of El Paso? It's the identical claims, and there's actually precedent for this, which was in 2012 when Arizona tried to have similar laws that they enacted to try to take in immigration enforcement and make it a state issue. There was two lawsuits. There was one done by the ACLU and other private entities that sued the the state of Arizona. And then there was a separate lawsuit that was done by the United States government that sued the state of Arizona. Here we have the same concept. We have one lawsuit, which is the cities and private entities and others who are challenging the Texas law. And we also have, again, the same thing where the United States government in its own lawsuit challenges the Texas law. And the theories in both cases are the same, which is that these efforts to enforce the immigration law, even if they could be considered in harmony with the immigration code, should still be viewed as preempted because when states start to speak with different minds as to how the immigration law is to be enforced, then the federal government ceases to be able to do many important things in a unanimous way, meaning they they don't the way they would deal with foreign nationals, the way they would deal with foreign governments, the way they would deal with various transportation issues, all of that becomes limited. And so all of that hence should be preempted from being able to be taken into the hands of the states as opposed to having the federal government run a uniform immigration system. And so that's the theory of this lawsuit. There's also a theory that it violates both the interstate and the foreign commerce clauses and Those matter as well from the standpoint, again, like we've talked about, of the relationships you have with 
regard to other countries, and if you're shutting down certain things with regard to immigration, do you unwittingly shut down legal areas of commerce as well? And from that standpoint, at least, vis-a-vis the precedent set in Arizona versus the United States, it's going to be very likely that there will be an injunction somewhere along the line, whether it's by the district court or the Fifth Circuit. But the question is, does the Supreme Court end up overturning the Arizona law? And we have three justices. We have Justice Coney Barrett, we have Justice Kavanaugh, we have Justice Gorsuch that have never said anything about the Arizona case. And so it will be interesting to see if those three will join Justice Alito and Justice Thomas, who ruled in favor of Arizona during the time of the Arizona litigation in order to create a 5-4 majority for overturning the Arizona case and actually allowing Texas to enforce this law. The Fifth Circuit, if it's following the Supreme Court precedent, will rule against Texas here. However, the Fifth Circuit, we've seen before, not follow precedent. Correct. It's possible the Fifth Circuit could say this is different than Arizona because at the end of the day, Texas isn't actually going to deport anybody. It's just going to put them right at the edge of the border and punish someone who then doesn't leave. But those distinctions are really dancing on the nail head of a pin. And I don't think those distinctions, if one was analyzing this in good faith, make it any different than Arizona. And so really it will just become maybe whether the Fifth Circuit wants to have some language in there that is dicta saying, although we're bound by Arizona, we think this is a wrong opinion and we hope that the Supreme Court takes it up and reverses it. I could see that easily happening, but we'll have to see how disciplined and how faithful the Fifth Circuit wants to be to the language of the Arizona Supreme Court decision. And in yet another case involving Texas immigration and the Biden administration, the administration is asking the Supreme Court to step in and allow it to remove parts of the 20-mile fence along the southern border. So Texas has built fencing, of razor wire fencing, along its border. And it's about 29 miles of fencing along the southern border. It's razor wire fencing along the Rio Grande. And what the Fifth Circuit did is they sided with Texas, saying that Texas could sue and say that the federal government was committing tort law violations by cutting down this wiring unless there was a humanitarian emergency or serious risk to human life. And what the federal government is saying is that's not how it works. There's a supremacy clause issue here, and the federal government gets to absolutely under federal statute, be able to decide what are the barriers that are actually placed between the United States and any foreign entity or anything on any border, and that that is the full authority of the Department of Homeland Security to do that. And so thus, the state of Texas should be enjoined from doing this under the All Writs Act. And the point is, they're saying that under the statute 8 U.S.C. 1357, that they have the ability to access this land within 25 miles of the border and be able to do anything they want to do within that land to protect the border. And if they feel in their judgment that this razor wire is harming their ability to do that, then they're permitted under the Supremacy Clause to cut down that wire. And so that's the question at the end of the day is, who's right? Does the state of Texas have the ability to sue the government for taking down its property under the Federal Tort Claims Act, or does the United States under the Supremacy Clause have the ability to say, no, you can't put up this razor wire fence? It sounds like an important question. Do you think the court will take it, take the case? I think the court will end up taking it. The federal government, when they ask for a Supreme Court review on an issue, they usually get it. And because the state of affairs at the moment is that Texas has defeated the United States government on an issue that the United States government says is inverted vis-a-vis the Supremacy Clause, the Supreme Court usually does get involved there to decide who's right about that. So there may be a few immigration cases the Supreme Court steps into. Thanks so much, Leon. That's Leon Fresco of Holland and Knight. 
Coming up next, Cher wants a conservatorship over her son Elijah Blue's money. I'm June Gross. When you're listening to Bloomberg. Cher has filed a petition for control of the finances of her son, Elijah Blue Allman, saying his struggles with addiction and mental health have left him unable to manage his money. The 47-year-old Allman receives money from a trust left by his late father, musician Greg Allman. But an L.A. judge refused to immediately put Allman into the conservatorship that Cher is seeking and he is opposing. The court will take up the issue again at another hearing on January 29th. Joining me is Chris Melcher, a partner at Walzer, Melcher & Yoda. So is Cher asking for a conservatorship over his finances or over his person? Petition for a conservatorship over the estate, which would give her control over his financial affairs. She did not check the box for a conservatorship over the person, which is the most restrictive type of conservatorship that would have given her control over essentially his body, you know, where he goes and who he sees, where he lives, medical decisions. Those type of things were not requested. It was a uh, over financial affairs only. So this is different from, let's say, the Britney Spears conservatorship. That's right. Britney found herself uh, under the most restrictive type of conservatorship possible where all of her liberties were essentially stripped from her and and granted to her father because that was a conservatorship of the person and also of the estate. We'll explain why she's asking for this conservatorship. Sure. So a, a conservatorship over the estate, meaning financial affairs, can be imposed for an adult when that that person is uh, unable to resist fraud or undue influence, usually because of some kind of health condition. So Cher is claiming that Elijah Blue you know, has a history of substance abuse problems that have been severe. I think Elijah Blue acknowledges that he's you know, had these problems. I mean, how could he not? He's been in and out of rehab. So Cher is under the belief that if Elijah Blue had access to all of his money, and apparently there was going to be some other big distributions, I think, coming up, that he would waste all the money on drugs or, you know, be taken advantage of, and that this was such a severe problem that he has that it could kill him, that that it's not just that his money would be gone, but that he would take so many drugs that he would die from it, is the, you know, the, the peril or risk that, sh- that Cher was alleging to grant her financial control over his life. And so what factors does a judge weigh in determining this? So the first question is, um, in this type of situation, is, I mean, ultimately, can Elijah Blue resist fraud and undue influence? So what physical or psychological problem does Elijah Blue have that would prohibit him or keep him from resisting efforts to defraud him or efforts to take advantage of him. That's the standard under the California Probate Code. The Probate Code in this particular situation doesn't say anything about drug or alcohol abuse, substance abuse problems. It's talking about the inability of an adult to resist fraud or undue influence such that we need to take away that adult's ability to manage their own financial affairs and place them into the hands of another. So again, it, she's a little bit off base in terms of the, you know, the box that she needs to fit into for conservatorship over the estate because the California Probate Code doesn't say that someone who might waste their money on drugs or alcohol needs to have the right to manage that money taken away. That, that's not the test. So here she would need to establish that this substance abuse problem that he has uh, rises to such an extreme level that if he had management over his bank account, for example, that someone would somehow convince him to give them all of that money, you know, that basically defraud him or pressure him to spend money on things that a normal, you know, adult would not do 
you know, taking advantage of some position or trust and confidence, these type of things. And she just has not been able to develop that evidence because, you know, I don't think she has this day-to-day relationship with him to know even who these folks are other than the wife that at the time was filing for divorce that she alleged that certainly would not be a, an appropriate person to manage his affairs because they were going through a divorce at that time. Sherrod just doesn't have access to the information to know, like, who are these people who are going to take advantage of him? Have people in the past taken advantage of him? Why can't uh, Elijah Blue resist efforts to defraud or exert undue influence over him? compared to any other adult. And I would just note that there are plenty of high-functioning, sophisticated adults who are defrauded. What happens in fraud cases is that there's con men or confidence men that are experts at uh, obtaining trust and confidence in others for purposes of defrauding them. And it's humiliating and horrible, but, you know, look at the Madoff's, you know, scam. I mean, there were very sophisticated investors who were defrauded by Madoff who don't need to be under a conservatorship. So this level of inability to resist fraud and undue influence has to be so severe that there are no less restrictive means available other than removing Elijah Blue's ability to manage his own finances and place them in shares' hands. He also said that he's been sober for more than three months, is attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and is willing to submit to drug tests. Yeah, that was an unusual request. In a conservatorship case that, you know, initial stages like we have right now, the question is whether he even needs one or not. And Elijah Blue is saying, no, I don't. And that although, you know, he appreciates the sentiment by his mother that this is unwelcome, you know, meddling and that she should kind of mind her own business, essentially, is what his <laughs> response was. He also said that while he has had severe problems with drug and alcohol um, abuse in the past, that he's been sober, he's going to AA, and then he volunteered to, you know, submit to some testing. Now, the way that I read that response is not to submit to court orders for, you know, compliance, but it was just a showing that he recognizes that he has a problem and that he is managing it as best as he can, and he doesn't need to have his rights taken away from him. You know, there there are other devices, uh, you know, legally available to someone who is unable to care for themselves as a result of some severe drug and alcohol problems. And um, that would hopefully start with somebody voluntarily checking themselves into a rehab program, which he has done previously. And the benefit of that is, is that if he's doing so voluntarily, there's probably a better chance of him succeeding because this is his own desire to get help rather than it being forced upon him or that he's going through the motions of a rehab because of some court case that he wants to get out of, and that's not as probably effective. If someone is unable to do that and has such a serious problem that they're unable to care for themselves or that they're a danger to others, then the state of California has the authority to protect him from himself or others by imposing a uh, you know, 5150 a psychiatric hold on him. And again, that, that's in a very severe situation, not, not just for drug abuse. It would have to be to the level where he's unable to care for himself or that he's, you know, such that he's a danger to himself or others. So that is a state-imposed mechanism that takes away temporarily his rights for his own protection. That is not a mother would do for a son. So again, that, that protection already exists you know, for a limited period that the state could do. The state hasn't done that. And so that would indicate that his problems may not be as severe as share claims because why hasn't the state you know, put a 5150 hold on him? So I think when Elijah Blue came to court in person, he showed up from the photographs of him walking out. He looked healthy. He was certainly not missing as Cher had insinuated that he had, you know, gone missing. He was there in person. I note that Cher did not show up in person. So I I think the chances of Cher getting this conservatorship are very low, especially the way that she handled some of the things procedurally 
it was not a good look for her in court. Yeah, there was this strange thing. The judge said that Cher's attorneys were unwilling to share material with Almond's attorneys and that Cher's lawyer said they had confidentiality concerns and shared the documents instead with Almond's court-appointed lawyer. So he has a court-appointed lawyer and his own lawyer. Well, he did. These conservatorships are, um, you know, a deprivation of liberty. This is uh, the court taking away somebody's liberty interests. In this particular case, a request to take away the ability to manage, you know, an adult's financial affairs and placing them in the hands of another adult. So for this to be imposed, there's a couple things that need to happen. One is notice has to be given. It has to be, I think it's 15 days of notice to the proposed conservatee, Elijah Blue, that he has to be brought to court in person, you know, unless he's truly missing. He has to be brought to court in person so that the court can make its own assessment. The court will also have a social worker do an assessment, and then he has a right to counsel. And so the court uh, will appoint that counsel for him. Uh, He also has a right to hire his own attorney. And so when the court... um, made its initial orders it appointed counsel for him and again this is really without any opportunity for him to you know say anything and then once he found out about it uh, he hired his own attorney and that attorney contacted Cher's attorney and said look we need all the court papers that you filed and they said no you know that is uh, unusual his- isn't it no you can't have the court papers it is it is horrific violation of his rights, and this is what happened to Britney Spears. It, it was even worse. The court there, the Los Angeles Superior Court, violated her rights under the probate code by imposing a conservatorship over her without notice while she was under a 5150 hold and appointed uh, counsel for her. And when she hired her own attorney at Shepard Mullen, uh, that attorney came into court to advocate on her behalf and was thrown out of court and said, we won't recognize you. So here, you know, this had the kind of similar bad vibes about it where Elijah Blue, who obviously has sufficient capacity to hire a lawyer, hires a lawyer and shares uh, attorneys won't give him the information that he needs to respond to a request to take away his rights, citing his own his own privacy. I mean, how, how could Elijah Blue's privacy rights being violated by providing information to Elijah Blue? It's absolutely ludicrous. And so this is an overreaching by Cher's attorney. And the court was very critical of Cher for doing that because, you know, again, the, the whole concept here is that we have one adult who is in such despair that they are unable to properly, you know, care for themselves and can't resist fraud or undue influence such that mom needs to come in there and take care of him. But then mom isn't respecting his rights, isn't respecting the right that Elijah Blue has to at least see the court papers. You know, he saw some of them, but not all of them. At least see all of the court papers that she had filed. That, again, calls into question her motivations. Why is she doing this? Why is she acting so quickly to take away his financial rights when I think there is maybe some distributions coming in there so she could get control over them without giving him a fair chance to even see all the court papers that she's filing against him or communicate with his own chosen attorney? And then I would also note that if his problems are so severe, why didn't she check the box for conservatorship over the person? Because if he's such a danger that he's going to go and take drugs and kill himself, well, then why wouldn't she force him into rehab? Because that would be the only true way of protecting him. I mean, he doesn't need a lot of money to, to get access to dangerous drugs and kill himself. But she's only sought the control over his finances, but she did not seek the ability to force him into a rehab, which is the help that he would truly need if she were correct. So this is, again, a complete misfire by her. And I don't know what her true motivations are, but it raises the hypothesis or theory that she is more interested in obtaining control over his finances than truly protecting him. 
The judge obviously denied the conservatorship at this point and scheduled another hearing for January 29th. Are judges much more reluctant to impose any kind of conservatorship in the light of the Britney Spears conservatorship? You know, one of the the benefits that came out of Britney Spears' abusive conservatorship was that there is more attention um, being paid on these, at least the celebrity conservatorship cases. And, you know, unfortunately for the non-celebrities, uh, you know, who, who is really watching those cases? It's really up to the court, the court-appointed attorney and social workers who are doing the investigations that are expected to protect these folks who allegedly need protection so that they're not taken advantage of by the conservators who are placed in control of their lives. So certainly after Brittany, and I, I think we are seeing a Brittany effect here in the share case, that um, the judge is, is acting appropriately and stepping up uh, quickly and, and criticizing uh, Cher for not having, you know, observed the rights of her son to have counsel of his own choosing and for that counsel to at least see all the court papers that were filed. And they're taking a much more appropriate look at it because, again, it, as we've been discussing here, there, there are some logical problems with what Cher is asking for. It, I can't imagine what it must be like for a parent to have a child who has long-term substance abuse problems, and I'm sure that's very scary for her, and she feels helpless, and she wants to act and do all this, and, and it's, a, I'm sure, horrible what she's going through in trying to protect her son. But the way she's going about it is not legally correct and is, is probably not likely to succeed. And fortunately, we have a judge here on the case that is protecting his rights. We'll see what happens at the next hearing. Thanks so much, Chris. That's Chris Melcher, a partner at Walzer, Melcher, and Yoda. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.